Trust and collaboration are essential business skills. You crave the brainstorming energy and productivity it creates, but at the same time, trying to wrap your arms around it feels like catching a wave. The tighter you try to hold on, the more you find yourself holding gritty grains of sand and sticky seaweed. Now, wouldn't it be nice to improve workplace trust and collaboration? Of course it would. And today's guest is an executive coach who will tell us how. This is Business Confidential Now with Hannah Hassel-Kelchner, helping you see business issues hiding in plain view that matter to your bottom line. Welcome to Business Confidential Now. I'm your host, Hannah Hassel-Kelchner, and today's guest is Jill Ratliff, an executive coach and leadership speaker with more than 20 years of Fortune 100 human resources management experience. Jill is also a longtime mentor with Path Builders, an organization that helps high-performing women accelerate their careers. More recently, she's written the book Leadership Through Trust and Collaboration, which is perfect for today's topic. So welcome to Business Confidential Now, Jill. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you. Now, you, one of the things that you write about is that the most important skills in leadership are gaining trust and knowing how to collaborate under stress. Absolutely. What is it that good leaders do in stressful moments that promote trust and collaboration? Well, you know, I think that um, the place where trust is broken and the place where we fail you know, to lead effectively is when the situation or the circumstance that we find ourselves in is greater than our capacity to maintain equanimity, calm, clarity, focus, and kindness, right? So the, the root of trust and collaboration is relationships, right? And then the ability to build them, have them, maintain them, and to lead, be able to lead in adversity. Because honestly, you know, when things are going well, we don't need help. When things are going well, our personalities aren't a problem. When things are going well, um, performance coaching is easy. So for me, adversity is the jewel of leadership, and it's the metal that tests your own leadership development and your ability to lead in those kinds of environments. So I I love that lane, and it's where a lot of my work sits. Okay, so you're working with a leader. The sauce has hit the fan. There's a mess. (laughs) And, and so how do you coach them to stay calm and everything's going to be all right? I mean, those are highly stressful times. Yeah. And okay, sometimes people could react a little better than they do. Yeah. But most people aren't ready to you sing Kumbaya and like, you know, let's toast marshmallows. Yeah. That There's stuff that needs to be done. There's cleanup that needs to be done. Sure. And it's not about you know, pointing fingers of blame, but it's like, hey, chop, chop, we got to get going here. Yeah. So how do you counsel them when everything inside them is screaming white hot? Hey, let's get on it. Mm -hmm. And yet that emotional outburst Mm -hmm. may or may not be the best way to express themselves at that point in time. Yeah. Well, and the, the truth of it is it never is the best way because, and how I counsel them is, you know, I start with helping people understand it's all about energy, right? Meaning that it's quantum physics, right? If you have a negative situation, negative energy is very strong, right? When you walk in a room and someone's upset or something's wrong or there's a challenge, what does it feel like when you walk in that room? You know it immediately, right? And even if you're in a group of people where five people are doing fine and one is really upset or concerned or, or off, it tends to cause the other people in the room to follow that negative energy. And then when we get that way, literally inside our brains, we lose the capacity to think clearly and to problem solve. So what you have to understand as a leader is one, and this is sort of one of the key sort of foundational principles of my work is that as a leader, you came to solve problems. That's what you get paid to do you know, when you run an organization, when you are promoted into management, you're basically, you just got the job title problem solver, because that's what the company's paying you to do. So one, you have to think differently about adversity at work and problems, because how could it be any other way? 
Um, I work mostly with organizations and leaders that are leading business transformation and change. And I think we all know that leadership and the role of leadership in today's world is to navigate transformation and change. Used to have the transformation once every couple of years, we'd have to take our organization through. Now they roll one on top of another. It's sort of constant pace of change. So it's just a foundational skill as a leader to understand, one, problems aren't the problem. They come every day, all day, and it's your job to help solve them. Two, the energy you bring into a room when there's a problem is everything about creating the ability to problem solve effectively with others. So if you're not able to do that and you're the leader, then clearly you're going to waste a lot of time and set back the process of problem solving. All of that is perfectly logical. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you ask, how do you do well, that? Then, yeah, well, yeah. why don't they do that? I mean, why isn't that the accepted norm instead of somebody exploding Yeah, because we, and yeah. everybody, you know, yeah. diving under the table? Yeah, because we weren't taught. You know, think about it. How did you learn how to solve problems? What to do when things are, when your situation or circumstance you're in is greater than your capability? You learned from your parents. You know, so we, we've we learned by watching how the people or the adults in our lives when we were young solved problems. And unfortunately, you know, they weren't taught either. So it's not a curriculum that we teach people. So part of my work, I start with, I have sort of three fundamental, you know, ways to think about work. And the very first one is self-mastery. But you have to understand that before you can lead anyone else, you have to be able to lead by example. In the first place, you have to be able to lead by examples in adversity. So you, I help people start looking at and understanding challenging moments and situations like this is game on. This is where you build your leadership muscle. And, you know, I can, I guess, make the point by sharing a story about um, a guy named Dorsey Levins, who's a running back with the Green Bay Packers. He played in two Super Bowls, and he is in the Green Bay Packer Hall of Fame. He's 45 years old, and he has a mental toughness and sports agility training company. And my son, who's a professional athlete, um, his organization hired Dorsey to train my son, Scott. And after a couple of weeks of training, he said to Dorsey, you know, you should meet my mom. You two are, you think so much alike. And Dorsey tells the story now, like, yeah, kid, sure. I'd love to meet your mom. You know, I'll work on that. And he put it off and put it off and put it off. And then finally, Scott just said, Dorsey, I don't think you understand. I think you really need to meet my mom. And so Dorsey says later, just to be nice to Scott, he agreed to meet me for a cup of coffee one morning. And we were going to meet from 9 to 9.30. This was his idea. And at noon, we were still sitting there. And then Dorsey came to work with me. And what he said is, you know, as an NFL running back, I thought I was tough. I thought I understood adversity. And I thought that, you know, I wouldn't have survived in the NFL. He goes, but what you've taught me that I didn't understand, that why I was successful as a running back is because I could take a hit and keep on going. It was yards after contact that they measured my success by. And the truth of it is, if the defense parted company and I ran straight into the end zone every time and scored, nobody would cheer for me. And that's that way in life. Like as leaders, and as teams that get in the foxhole together, when we solve problems for our organization or for our team and we overcome, that's like where we cheer for ourselves. That's where we grow. That's where we, you know, where we build confidence. So when we look at adversity or challenge as a problem that shouldn't be happening, it's hilarious, right, in business today. How could we go through a transformation, throw everything into the air, have competition like we've never had before, have challenges in the world like we've never had before, and somehow think that we're all going to get together under that kind of pressure and not have challenges. So we have to change the whole way we think about adversity at work and managing other people's stress when you're a leader. And so step one is you can't begin to help people under stress if you do not understand where you hold and where you fold. And what I would say, Hannah, is it's a skill. It is not a personality trait. You learn how to do it with a few simple tools and then practice. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. And I'm telling you, it is a superpower. If every leader knew how to do it, we would change our cultures overnight in our companies. 
Well, I'm sure there are a lot of employees and, you know, the entrepreneurs that that are listening who are like, yeah, that's why I started my business because (laughs) I was working for somebody like that who just didn't 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 get it. it, Um, But then they don't want to fall into the same trap, right? Exactly. So uh, when you talk about knowing where you hold and and where where you you fold, fold, I love that phrase. Yeah. Uh, Let me ask you this, though. How do you figure that out? Oh. Um, because it's really hard to admit yeah. <laughs> um, our, our weaknesses, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, nobody yeah. wants to admit like, yeah, I really suck at that. That's no yeah. good. So, um, yeah. Especially when you're a leader because right. you're supposed to know it all. You're supposed to have the answers, right? Yeah. Well, that's the first fallacy, of right. course, right? You know, uh, I, I remember when I figured out that at some point I thought by age 60, for sure, I would have figured it out, right? I just thought by then I'm going to be on the high road, I'm going to know it all. And then you realize, like, the older I get, the more I know how much I don't know. Like, it, there's a humility and there's a comfortableness in your skin and there's a, like, absolute, you know, innate confidence that comes when you can look in the mirror and go, thank God I don't have to know it all. <laughs> and there's so many smart people right below me, beside me, all around me on a podcast. There's a billion ways to get answers, questions you don't know. But if you do not have the courage to ask or to humble yourself or to give up the idea that, you know, anyone knows it all, then obviously you're behind the eight ball, right? So I think that, you know, it's very funny. I work mostly with CEOs and C-suite leaders, so pretty senior leaders. And it's so funny when I start working with them, they ask the same question you just did. Like, how do I know when I hold and when I fold? Like, where do I even start? And so the first week, all I ask them to do is all I want you to do throughout the day is notice any time of the day when you do not, when something does not feel good, period, like a paper cut. Just it, And how do you know who doesn't feel good? Well, um, calm or confident or stability or contentedness is neutral, right? I feel fine is the answer. And then above fine, yes, I feel great. I feel hopeful. I feel optimistic. God, I'm so excited. So all the emotions that go all the way up to bliss and happiness, right, on that scale. And then below, I feel calm or stable or confident is I feel frustrated. I feel annoyed. I feel angry. I feel overwhelmed. I feel whatever. And then it goes all the way down to depression, grief, and all sorts of other really negative things, right? So I'm like, just notice when you're above the line or below the line. That's all. And when you're below the line, just notice what it is that put you there. Did somebody say something? Were you thinking something that made you crazy? Did something happen? Did somebody do something at work or a circumstance come up that like you felt like shouldn't have happened? Just notice what it is. That's all. Just notice. And then I just, you know, next week when we talk, I just want to see what, what you saw. So what felt good, what didn't feel good. And we're just going to talk about that. And and where it doesn't feel good is where you're folding. It's where you have an opportunity to look at that situation differently. And I've had so many, you know, CEOs and senior people say, God, I had no idea how many times in a day that happens. Like a lot. So that's how you know where you hold and where you fold. It's where the circumstance or situation throws you off your game, meaning you're less than you know, as capable as you could be to lead in that moment, because your emotions and your energy is negative. And, you know, honestly, simple quantum physics, any negative energy is going to precipitate or create more negative energy. So if your situation's negative, or you're the one that's negative, you're not going to get a positive outcome from whoever you're with or whatever problem you're trying to solve. So you have to know how to one, recognize that the situation just got negative Two, how to pause, hold, stand still for a minute, rethink and regroup, and then act in a positive manner, or at least take a step in a positive direction to not make that situation or circumstance worse than it already is, and then bring people along that way. But it's just a practice. It's a practice of what I call notice that you're in it, choose a different way of responding than reacting, and three, practice. And what you're going to notice is we all have common themes. My themes are you know, are different than yours, different than it. But you will notice in your life that, wow, when I looked at it over a couple of weeks time, it's a pattern. It's this consistently, it's this kind of person that just triggers me every time, or it's these kind of situations just trigger me every time. And once you see your patterns, it's not that hard to change them. Um, So to me, a lot of this work about leading is about, and trust and collaboration and interacting with people at work is about relationships 
right, and how to build effective ones, but we don't even know how to build a great relationship with ourselves when we're stressed, much less anyone else. So that's kind of how I approach the work or look at the work is around what I call the human operating system, which is self-management, know how to master your own emotions and thoughts first in adversity to relationship mastery. How do you help other people, no matter what state and condition they're in from a position of strength? And then three, how do you master change and transformation when things are going the way you didn't think they should go, right? Because guess what? You don't get to decide, right? How things go at work. There's a lot of other people playing the game. So you don't get to that, choose, yeah, right? Absolutely. So you have to be able to meet the changes and the setbacks and the disappointments and the decisions other people make that no one asked your opinion. You have to be able to meet those, those um, uncertainties and those decisions of other people and know how to navigate those to always keep going forward. As a leader, that's your responsibility. So I have simple tools in each of these areas that I just, teach people the skill of doing that and then it's just a question of practicing and what's super fun about it is when you do you start realizing oh my god we've made this so much harder than it is understood understood so in your experience what traits do people gravitate to in leaders that makes them want to follow someone because we're talking about trust and collaboration sure i I appreciate what you're saying about hey get a grip on it for yourself first the self-mastery right right, okay but where where does the attraction come in and and i don't mean in a sexual way but i mean in in terms (laughs) of no, 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 no. Yeah, I get what pe- you're people saying. People sure. saying, hey, I, well, you know what? I'm going to quit my job. If you're leaving, I'm going with you. You know, that kind of thing. That yeah. that level of commitment or yeah. loyalty, <laughs> uh, if you will, uh, where people mm-hmm. say, yeah, I want to continue working with you. You totally. know, I will move if I have yep. to. Yep. So what what is it? And it happens, yeah. right? And it absolutely happens. There's a section in my book called Best Boss Ever. And I started thinking over my 30-year career, I've had a lot of bosses. And I thought, who are my best bosses ever? And then I thought, oh, this is going to be an impossible task. And then I sat down and I realized it wasn't that hard. I could pick five that stood out over probably 50 bosses I've had over my lifetime. And then I took each one of their names and I wrote it on a piece of paper and I said, why did I pick that person? And then I looked at all five and they were different reasons. But then I looked at what was the theme of all of it. And you know what it comes down to in the end? These are people who made you feel a certain way better about yourself. Right. Right. So, right. So the best bosses, the bottom line is the best bosses, you know, have an ability to, to be able to make you feel as though they see you, hear you, appreciate you and hold a vision of you and your performance greater than you can hold of yourself at that time. Right. And so some of the simple things, right, they're simple things. Their character traits is sort of where you are going, right? They are um, an ability to deliver a kind message to you in terms when you get, they always say I've given, I've had to fire thousands of people in my role as a CHRO, right? And I've had so many people say, if I had to get fired, I, w- I want to get fired by you. Because no matter how hard the feedback is, you have to give somebody, there's a kind way to do it. Um, Two, you have to not cross the fence and try to solve other people's problems for them. You have to understand when somebody has a problem. Sometimes you just tell them, hey, I think you've got this. Go, you know, go think about it, work on it, look in this area, like guide them rather than become the person who tells them what to do. Um, Best bosses give you time. What's the most valuable resource any one of us have in today's world, period, it's time, right? So when you take when an employee needs your ear or needs something or needs your attention and you pick up the phone and call them, look in our COVID world today, right? And you take the time as a leader to pick up the call, even if it's a 10 minute call and you're not calling for any reason other than to check in and see how that person's doing. You're giving them your time and that creates great loyalty. So bottom line is there's just some, they're simple things. They are not hard things to do but you have to decide and here's the 
I guess, the tool I would have people take. Before you decide what you need to do as a leader, you've got to sit down and decide who do you want to be as a leader. And then you've got to decide you're going to be that regardless of the circumstance, whether it's good, bad, neutral. You're going to be that leader and you're going to do what a person who is that kind of leader does in any circumstance. And then obviously, you know, you're going to, you know, have the loyalty and commitment of your people. So the model be, do, have, Zig Ziglar brought it in, Tony Robbins picked it up. I mean, I don't know how many other leadership people have picked it up, but it's so profoundly simple. Like be, do, have is the only way that works when, but, but what most people do say is I want to have, you know, responsibility at the high level. What do I have to do to get that? And then when that happens, I'll be happy or I'll be successful. But that model actually doesn't work as a leadership model. You have to flip it around the other way. Very good. Now, if you had to boil down the key elements necessary to build trust, would they be the same? Yeah, they would be the same. Uh, So what's the definition of trust? If you ask people that, most people don't know, right? The definition of trust is a belief in the strength or capability of a thing or a person. And the operative word there is the belief in the strength or capability of a thing or a person. So if somebody trusts you, it's that it's that they believe in you. And if they believe in you, one, you have to be competent at your job. And so again, if you can't handle stress or circumstances or situations and you can't think clearly in a crisis, then your credibility right there is damaged, your trust is damaged. And then two, belief is this you know, odd word, right? That just is an emotion. It's a, you know, it's a feeling, not a thinking thing. So how many times have you heard as a leader, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When I say that to a leader, everybody nods their head yes, like, because that's pure wisdom, right? Like everybody nods their head yes. Oh, that makes so much sense. But then watch whether leaders actually exercise that very foundational piece of wisdom, when there's a problem, you know, and they got the answer and they think they're right. They just charge in and they start telling everybody what they know. When people are upset or confused or off or the performance is off, you got to start with these people have to know that you have their back, that you actually care about the fact they're struggling, that you care that this is a difficult situation. You got to start with care first before you start telling people what you know or what you think they should do. It's just not that hard, but when, and we all do it, when everything's going great, but where we lose it is when something's off. And then we forget that we're supposed to do that. We charge right in on our white horses, like we're the, you know, be all, end all answer person for everything. And we disable people in the process. We don't even give them the chance to rise up. Well, there's, there's probably an assumption like, well, they know I care and uh, time is of the essence. So a, they know I'm assuming it and, you know, we just have to solve this. Boom. So, but. It, yeah, but think about it. Yeah, it doesn't work though. Because even think about it in your family. Right. Like, you know, your parents love you, but does it hurt when they yell at you and they lose their crap and they, you know, start screaming at you? Yeah. Still, you might know your parents love you, but it's just still not helpful right. when they can't, right? When they can't act reasonably, responsibly and calmly, regardless of the challenge. Absolutely. And the problem is, you, see, I hear what you're saying. There's a sense of urgency in business when some, well, a million dollar client just canceled our contract and we, you know, whatever. There's clearly a sense of urgency. But what people don't understand is negative or frenetic or scattered thinking or behavior does not solve that problem faster. It just doesn't. It slows it down. Right. So there's a power in equanimity. There's a power in the ability to not get triggered. There's not Things don't get done better or faster because you're yelling. People become shut down. They become disengaged. They become fearful. Their their problem-solving abilities do not improve when you escalate the intensity in the room. Understood. But the person who's escalating the intensity, A, wants to get it done their way and say they don't care about whether they shut somebody down. It's like, here's the answer. Boom, go do it. Right, right. But now we're back to that's just not right. a good leader. Oh, yeah. Right? So if we're, right, if we're talking about leadership, then that's why I'm saying, you know, leadership. I cannot tell you the millions and millions and millions of dollars I've spent on leadership programs for my organizations every time, right? You pick them, send everybody, you name, trust Colorado, climb mountains, go to Harvard, so many leadership programs. 
but if I had to do it all again, I would throw all of them out and I would spend all my money on a course called Lead by Example. And I would teach people how to do that. Understood. And I could appreciate appreciate why. Our time is running short, but there's two other things that I wanted to discuss with you. And okay, yeah. fine. We we're focusing on the individual. You know, they need to build themselves, understand themselves, uh, control right. the emotional aspect because it can trigger other people. It is, right. It's counterproductive. All right. that's good. How do they break down silos? Yeah, well, I think it's the same question, right? It's the problem we have in our world today, right? And the challenge with silos is right and wrong and perspective. If you're looking at it through only one perspective and you're saying, I'm right, you're wrong, you're not ever going to break down silos. So the answer to breaking down silos and as a leader is finding the common ground. There's always a third option. I'm quoting Arianna Huffington, right? We're, we're stuck in this duality, this binary way of thinking, right, wrong, go left, go right. It's good. It's bad. I'm right. You're wrong. But there's always a third option. There's always a third option. And you bring people together. You as a leader, keep people focused on what do we have in common. And by the way, if you work for the same company, it can't be that hard to find what you have in common. And then you step back from what you have in common to the problem that you have at hand. And then you brainstorm how you get needs met, right? And how you come up with the best solution that includes, and as a leader, you have to let people know that, hey, I want all the best ideas on the table. I'm going to hear everybody. We're going to take into account what people say. But at the end of the day, you know, it's your job as a leader to make that decision. And you have to let people know that that that's going to happen. There's a simple model I can tell you, and I don't know if we have time, but it's, it's denial, rejection, acceptance, and alignment. And when a decision is made by the person who gets to make that decision, because they're accountable to make that decision. You can respond deny in denial. Can't believe they did that. They didn't do. You can respond in rejection where you just, you know, you overtly or covertly reject the, the right to make that decision or to go along. You can be in acceptance, meaning you comply with the decision they made, or you can get aligned with the fact that you gave it your best shot. You gave them your best feedback. You gave input. You gave, but now at the end of the day, decisions been made. And you got to get behind it and you got to help it be successful. And those kind of people are the kind of people that get advanced at work, that get promoted at work, that ultimately become, you know, the best leaders that we have in our organizations because they're always looking for the possibility. They're always looking for the win. They're always looking for how do we get better. And anything else is what I call an oar in the water. If you're a leader in an organization and you can't, work your way to alignment in a healthy and productive way and know when it's time to get on board, you're just putting your oar in the water. And, and my team, when I had people with oars in the water, I would sit down and talk to them. And I'd say, look, I love you as a person. You have great talents, but I can't lead this organization with your oar in the water. I need your support. So you've got to talk to me and tell me what, you know, what do you need that you're not getting? And if I can give it to you, I will. And if I can't, I need you to, I need to ask you to get on board. And if you can, it's okay, but you can't stay on this team. So you just have to learn how to have kind, but clear conversations with people to gain alignment. And also, but you got to be stable and calm, right? And clear. And also focus. Focus. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on the greater good. Totally. Which is terrific because that's also a way to model collaboration, isn't it? Yes. And it's the highest form of human motivation to belong to something greater than myself. That is the highest form of human. That's why sports are so popular because people can t uh, attach to a team. It's, they get to be a part of something greater than themselves. They get to win with, you know, their team. Right. And, and there's just that, that form of feeling like I belong is a basic human need, right? It's a Maslow's hierarchy. I belong. I'm part of something greater than myself. And as a leader, boy, if you can figure out how to do that, it's just magic. It's just magic. But you have to be intentional. You have to know that's what you're trying to do and that's your job. And then you have to be authentic about it because people can see right through, you know, a platitude or they can see right through something that doesn't really have meaning for you. So that goes back to the be, do, have model. You know, honestly, you have to decide who you want to be as a leader and what's motivating you and what you believe in that's greater than you, or how do you represent your vision or the company's vision in a way that inc it's inclusive for people on your team. And then you got to help them see that it is. 
And then you got to just be kind, you know, honestly. If we did nothing more than learned how to be kind in adversity, we'd be way ahead of where we are now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that sums it up perfectly. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. <laughs> this really has been a, an interesting conversation. Jill's book, again, is Leadership Through Trust and Collaboration. Of course, it's available at your favorite bookseller and on and Amazon. So thank you for joining me today, Jill. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. So that's our show for today. But don't go anywhere. I have a really easy ask for you. Would you please open your podcast app and give us a five-star review and leave a comment about what you love most about the show? I do read them all, and it'll take you less than a minute. And while you're at it, share this episode. Tell someone about it, because the best way to grow our audience is by word of mouth. And if you want the detailed show notes, links to connect with my guest, or cool stuff that we talked about, or even if you want to ask a question or have a show idea, come on over to businessconfidentialradio.com. I'll catch you on the next episode, and in the meantime, have a great day and an even better tomorrow.